welcome, welcome. What a beautiful spread of faces. We are on day three of our celebration of Scotland's Indigenous Apothecary. Yes, it's a bit of a mouthful. It means um, plants of the lands. <laughs> My name is Anna Ross. Um, and myself, along with Fiona Gilbertson and the other Scottish Psychedelic Research Group team, have put on this event. The Scottish Psychedelic Research Group was set up uh, a year and a half ago in recognition that there is no collaborative, grassroots research and sort of a knowledge exchange community in Scotland as it stands. As you're all aware, psychedelics is experiencing a, a so-called renaissance in, uh, around the world. But what we felt when we were setting up the SPRG is that much of this renaissance was coming from the medical community. And even when it is coming from the indigenous community, it's getting streamlined into a medical way of thinking and a medical way of doing it. And being psychedelic users ourselves and understanding the power of this medicine we know that there are many, many people within Scotland that are currently using these medicines and are acting as healers for their community. On top of that, there is also a growing number of people within the therapeutic community that are interested in this kind of medicine. So what we were really wanting to create and what we seem to be creating going forward is this community voice. So here in Scotland, we are in crisis, not just with mental health, but also um, in terms of substance misuse. So I've got a few facts to share with you that are actually quite alarming. So in 2021, there were more than 1,300 drug deaths in Scotland. In 2021, there were more than 14,000 drug-related um, hospital stays in Scotland. In 2022, in a three-month period, there were more than 10,000 referrals for substance misuse and alcohol misuse, and those were referrals in the community. In 2021, there were 753 suicides in Scotland. And these are all sobering statistics um, that are actually quite hard to stomach, and we don't compare very well either to the home nations or elsewhere in Europe. So it's timely now that we have new therapies on the horizon, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We're very lucky that there's been a huge reinvestment in psychedelics and in psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. We're seeing a huge resurgence in interest, which is very valuable to all of us. Australia have jumped forward as the first country to legalize some of the psychedelic medicines. So what they did was it was the Therapeutic Goods Administration reviewed all the clinical evidence, and they have now authorised from July 2023 the use of MDMA for PTSD and psilocybin for treatment-resistant depression. That would only be under the supervision of psychiatrists, and they would remain con controlled drugs, but this is a huge step forward. But we have such a great need in Scotland, and we already have countries leading the way elsewhere. I'm going to pass on to our first speaker, who is Professor Jo Neal, who's from uh, the University of Manchester. She's a professor of psychopharmacology. Jo has a breadth of experience in drug discovery. She is a trustee of Heroic Hearts UK. They fund trips to South America for military veterans so that they can go to uh, retreats that, uh, well, they're ayahuasca retreats. And the results they've had are absolutely stunning. So, Joe, I'm going to hand over to you. As Ailsa said, I've worked in drug discovery my whole career, and that's coming up for 40 years nearly. You know, it's very hard to imagine. Um, <laughs> so, and I um, was an animal researcher for my sins, and it was establishing animal models to test the efficacy of new psychiatric medicines for all sorts of disorders, for addiction, for trauma, for panic, for anxiety, for schizophrenia, for depression. And in all that time, we have come nowhere. All that work that I did, the brilliant molecules that pharma, big and small, came up with the brilliant ideas and the targets that they were, the brain targets that they were going for. In all that time, none of them reached the market, reached patients 
and none of them improved the quality of life for patients, which is what I always wanted to do. So about six years ago, I decided to give all that up and to focus the rest of my career and all the effort I have and all the knowledge I've acquired on working on psychedelic assisted therapy. So and to, well, in any way that I can, having joined drug science and joined heroic hearts, education is one of the things I can do. And also lobbying the government to reschedule psychedelics. So they sit in schedule one of the Misuse of Drugs Act and the UN Convention. The definition of a Schedule One drug is that it's got no medicinal therapeutic benefit, which we all know is not true now, and actually so many trials are, are proving that to be, to be not true. You can do the research, you just apply to the Home Office to get a controlled drugs licence, which I have done, and I have got one. But it took me a year, it cost me about £5,000. So there's so much stigma around this area that if you're going to do any kind of research, um, you need a lot more time and a lot more money. So the drug laws are stopping people doing research, and that's, that's just an absolute disgrace. The other thing is that the drugs that we have in psychiatry now are still based on the drugs that were discovered serendipitously in the 1950s. The reason that I've, I've switched to, onto psychiatry is that they work. The clinical trials now are showing that they work remarkably well for, for illnesses that it's very, very hard for the psychiatrists to treat. So severe depression, treatment-resistant depression, where somebody has tried four or five of our currently available antidepressants and has still not responded. Post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of people do not respond to therapy and to the, the SSRIs. Addictions, what do we have to really help people with addiction? Of course, these are ancient medicines. We're talking about psilocybin, the active ingredient of magic mushrooms. DMT, the active ingredient of, of ayahuasca, sorry, from the Banisteriopsis um, vine in, uh, that grows naturally in South America. These are naturally occurring plants, aren't they? Hoffman synthesized LSD in the lab in 1938. And he worked for Sandoz, so he worked for a big pharmaceutical company. They knew there was something important about this, that it was loads of value medicinally. They didn't know what for. So they distributed it to anybody with the qualification to research this, to psychotherapists, to um, psychiatrists. And there was loads of work done in the 50s and the 60s until it got put into Schedule 1, Class A drug, by the Nixon administration. Because we all know what psychedelics do. We know that they, they reset the brain. They, you, they reframe the way you interact with people, become uh, more empathetic, interact better, you know, your connection with nature. And the Nixon administration were fighting a war in Vietnam and they didn't want people to feel like that. You know, they wanted people to fight this war for them. And they've been there ever since. That's 52 years ago. The research in those days was so, there were a, over a thousand papers published um, in those days. And the research was really good, uh, LSD for pain, for the existential anxiety and depression that occurs with a terminal diagnosis or a life-threatening diagnosis, um, and for addictions. So there's a lot of really good work done in those days. So this psychedelic renaissance that we're seeing now and the results with MDMA in their phase three trial for treating PTSD, they're extraordinary. 67% of people in Rick Dublin's phase three trial no longer met the criteria for PTSD. That's absolutely extraordinary. Those are results that I've never seen in all the time I've been doing this with all these new um, new chemical entities that we worked with. The DMT trial for severe depression has just read out. I don't know if you've seen the press release. I'm sure you have. You know, those results are extraordinary in that 50% of people were in remission 12 weeks after one dose of DMT. That's not to say that it works for everyone. That's not to say that it's suitable for everybody. The four things I tell people uh, about psychedelics is that they heal people. Healing is not a word we use in psychiatry. We manage symptoms by giving somebody a drug that they have to take every day. 
So that means that you will have a large side effect burden. This is a completely new paradigm in, in treatment of lots of disorders. One or two high doses assist, uh, with all the assisted therapy. But you're not having a drug that you have to take on the regs at all. Maybe you need a top-up dose in a year, six months. That's extraordinary. We are starting to understand a bit about the science that they induce neuroplasticity. And that's something that's, that gives you this long-lasting benefit. So it, it is an extraordinarily exciting time to have a therapy that we can offer to some people where it is likely to help them uh, um, and to heal them. I am going to hand over very quickly to Dr. Murad Awahba, who has come up from Newcastle. Uh, Murad is in, has been involved in the clinical trials on uh, psilocybin and depression, and he's going to elaborate on those for us. Thank you. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a senior uh, trainee working in Newcastle. I was lucky enough to work on one of the trials last year for treatment just in depression. And through this, I've kind of come to know a little bit of the research that's coming out. So you guys will know this. This is a Liberty Cap. Um, it's one of uh, several, several uh, different families of mushrooms that contain psilocybin. And because they're in so many different families, um, people studying this thought that they might be transferred by something called horizontal gene transfer, which basically means it jumped between families because it has an effect or it has a use for the different mushrooms. So they think that the use is actually as an insect repellent um, because of its psychoactive effects. Uh, of course, in people, it has a very, very different effect. You'll know that there are these mushroom stones, or at least that's one of the theories that there are mushroom stones, about 500 BC um, that um, suggest that people perhaps um, use them for uh, the um, divine, connecting with the divine and connecting with something that's outside of them. And then around 1957, Gordon Wasson, a banker from the States, went to Mexico, met Maria Sabina, brought the mushrooms back, brought them to Albert Hoffman. He synthesized those as well, very clever man. And then they were used for a long time until the 1970s. And then research halted until about 2006. We're going to talk a bit about mystical experiences because they're part of what we measure, really, or to try and measure, because it's a really difficult thing to measure. But if we were to try and boil it down, it has so seven uh, different aspects. So unity, uh, the sense of connectedness, and then there's an noetic quality, a sense of knowing, um, sacredness, a sense of something that is divine and sacred, positive affect, ineffability, which is, of course, the inability to describe it, ego loss, and the loss of space and time. So. So far, it seems to be that the um, people who have this mystical experiences seem to have better outcomes than people who don't in, in the trials. After 2006, um, they started looking at them a little bit more deeply and basically looking at people who are about to die, who are, who are reaching the end of their life, who had cancer, who find it, found it really quite difficult to uh, come to terms with their diagnosis, found it quite difficult to come to terms with, with, their, with their death. And uh, while the first study wasn't really that effective, the second couple of studies that were a bit bigger showed a really positive effect that long outlasted the effect of the drug on the body. It stayed, so you know, the effect of the drug is about six hours. It's completely out of the body by 24 hours. For these people, it stayed for up to six, six months and even longer at some points. Based on this, or based on uh, one of the uh, um, ideas uh, down in London from Imperial College, they thought, okay, well, psilocybin affects a certain part of the brain. Maybe it works for depression. So they started looking at it for depression as well. It was really very effective for people that have been treatment resistant for years. And so they thought, okay, let's try and recreate this in a larger trial, which is the one that I was ultimately involved with. And the effects were really quite remarkable. People who received the 25 milligram dose uh, got a lot better than people who had received the one milligram dose. Uh, this is not just a statistically significant effect. This is also a clinically meaningful effect because sometimes things can be statistically meaningful but not really, don't translate on the ground. But this translates on the ground to, a, to, a, to an effect that's quite meaningful and it stayed for peop with people for up to three months as well. Same kind of stuff. So this has basically just been recreated over and over again with the, it's always psilocybin but with either one or two different doses. This one, uh, it came out exactly, uh, um, at least as good as escitalopram, which is one of the leading antidepressants. There is a repeated positive effect of giving psilocybin either one 
or two times with psychological support. And it's not just with depression, which is the interesting bit. People with alcoholism, for example, there was a lar larger study, about 92 people. The people who received psilocybin were about half, had about half or even less as much heavy drinking days. Heavy drinking days were like days with four or five drinks. What could be happening? Short answer, we don't know. One of the hypotheses, one of them, is that if your brain is a prediction machine, which we think it might be, it basically predicts the reality that you get. So we get a lot of information from the world. This information is um, compared to the schema you have of the world, and then you have a prediction of what's going on. For some people, this schema is quite rigid, and it distorts the way reality is perceived. And uh, for in illnesses like depression, like substance misuse, uh, this rigidity can lead to these symptoms, or that's the hypothesis. One of them is that psilocybin and other psychedelics relax these schemas a bit, so it allows people some space to revise these thoughts that they've got. So yeah, why is this interesting? Because we've got a drug that the effects outlast the drug action. They can tell us a lot about the brain and how it works when you distort something so much, and th this effect is so significantly different from your day-to-day -day consciousness. It can tell us a lot about what it is to be human, what it is to be conscious, what it is to have an ego, what it is to have a person. There's a lot you can learn from this, well, for lack of a better word, disruption that happens in the brain due to the ingestion. They can tell us a bit about antidepressants work and they might even change how we think about death, mainly because of how significantly people react when they are about to, to meet their death and how the acceptance of that can change after an experience. Having something like this that might change how we interact with it is really, is really quite something. This is the amount of papers, the number of papers that have been um, um, published. And look at the difference here from 20, yeah, 2017, 2018 till now, shot up. And this is just gonna keep going up. It's so hard to keep up now, it's just moving really quickly. We're about to talk about the lived experience of psychedelics for mental health. Rory is an ex-Scotland rugby player and has been through an incredible journey following a, um, a sequence of injuries and events that led to a deterioration in his mental health. I will say no more, but I will pass over to Rory. I had a, just about a 10-year professional career, played at the, the highest level of the game and achieved a lot of glory, played at two World Cups, uh, childhood dreams being uh, achieved. Um, but on the other side of that, there was, a, there was a, a, a dark side, a big price to be paid. And that was the, the effects of injuries um, and the demands of the game. So in my 10 years as a professional player, I had 15 surgeries and I was on pharmaceutical drugs every day, opioids, uh, anti-inflammatories, and at l later points in my career, benzos, huge cocktails of, of different chemicals. And I also, on top of that, was knocked unconscious 12 times, and um, anyone who's looked into the effect of concussion knows that it can have a profound effect on mental health. So in, at the age of 29, I uh, got a career-ending injury, this was 2012, and uh, it was a broken leg, and uh, was a year later sacked for being injured, unable to, to heal. And not long after uh, retiring from the game, forced retirement, um, I had to have more surgeries on, on the injury, and I was put on an antibiotics because I got a surgical infection. Immediately after the antibiotics, my digestive health collapsed. So I, at this time in my life, I was navigating the big emotional trauma of losing my, my job, my way of life, uh, the only thing that I'd ever really known. So I dedicated my life from childhood to, to rugby, to that sport. But here I was, 29 years old, uh, discarded from the game, uh, losing my, my identity as a sports person, losing all my friends, my, my rugby family. Here I was navigating a very complicated situation, emotional pain from the loss, and also the loss of my, my physical health. I, I lost four stone in four months because I was struggling to eat any food. I had numerous other symptoms that were, were 
uh, popping up, muscle spasms, uh, sort of tachycardia, like heart palpitations, uh, chronic fatigue. I was in I was in a real bad way on a physical level and on an emotional level, and it didn't take me long to spiral down into a dark depression uh, and suicidal ideation, um, and I was stuck in this state of you know pain for for a, a year and a half. Um, and I was in the, the stage of thinking, well, if this continues for much longer, I'm going to have to take my own life because this was, it was just, it felt unbearable, the emotional and physical discomfort that I was going through. A miracle came through, and that was when I, I heard uh, Aubrey Marcus's testimonial on the Joe Rogan podcast. It's back in 2014. And he was speaking about his experience with the plant medicine Iboga, you know, speaking about it for about 30 minutes and when I listened to that I knew this was something that was really going to help me I just knew this was the the intervention that I'd kind of been praying for and a couple of weeks later I managed to get myself out to uh, Costa Rica which wasn't easy at the time because I had a broken leg that also wouldn't heal so I was struggling to walk I ended up having in 10 days I had three ceremonial doses of iboga and I won't go into the details because it's you know, it's, you know, take the rest of the day just to go through one journey. But the the result was a transformation of my overall outlook. My depression and suicidal ideation had switched off after one evening spent with this medicine. Um, and I was given a blueprint for moving forward with my life. And I could see a way through the challenges that I was facing, which I couldn't before. I felt completely blocked, I felt trapped, and after sitting with this medicine, I could see a way forward. Hope returned. From that point onwards, I started cultivating life where I was focusing on natural medicines, natural therapies to, to support my healing, uh, breath work, meditation, nutrition. And then also, very quickly after that experience, I was introduced to a couple of Colombian brothers who served ayahuasca, and they invited me out to... Uh, Colombia and I ventured out with them, spent time with them and they took me down into the Putumayo region with the Kofan, the indig indigenous healers down there, the Titus down there and I went on this adventure of self-discovery working with ayahuasca, deepening my healing, deepening my understanding of my life and integrating the indigenous wisdom uh, which has been a absolute profound part of my, my healing journey is that the wisdom that the indigenous uh, tribes carry and I've you know, a huge amount of gratitude spent. So I spent a few weeks out in the deepest, darkest part of the jungle, like getting that, those downloads. And um, over the next few years from 2015 to 2019, I ended up going to Peru as well, spending time with the Shipibo, learning from their ways, which Again, I cannot like explain the profound effect this had on my, my self-awareness, um, my outlook on life, uh, my understanding of the role of trauma, how a lot of my defective dysfunctional behavior and uh, the chaos in my life had been rooted in the trauma, the difficult childhood experiences that I'd gone through. So you know, that was up until 2019. Um, and since that point onwards, I've been really integrating that, that wisdom, these experiences with these life-saving medicines um, into, into my life where I have managed to, through all the other practices of diet, you know, breath work, nature immersion, you know, all, the, all the good stuff, reconnection to Mother Nature, I have gone through a radical shift in the, my physical healing and also a radical shift in my consciousness where I am no longer haunted by the wounds of my, my past. I am able to navigate the challenges in my life with a lot more grace, a lot more peace, and um, have really managed to, through working with these medicines and connecting with the indigenous, managed to cultivate a life of real joy and connection my, my gratitude to these these medicines and also to the keepers of the medicines because we cannot ignore and it's amazing with the the, the scientific research that is 
been shown with the power of some of these medicines, but we can't ignore the, the indigenous and their, their wisdom that they carry from thousands of years of working with these medicines and working with the, in the, what you know, Groff will call the transpersonal realms, the unseen realms. And so, um, yeah, huge amount of gratitude to these medicines and it's really beautiful time happening on planet Earth and I'm really excited to see this movement happening in Scotland and community coming together at this time. And so I think this is what, what's taking place today is pioneering. Huge thank you to Fiona and Anna and everyone else who has contributed to the, the last three, three days and, and every, everything else that's been taking place here. I really believe that the future is bright and this land needs uh, individuals like each one of you here. We need to spread the message and uh, because we know how much suffering there is in this in this land with the, the rate of suicide, uh, particularly you know in, in uh, with across the population, but you know 75% of suicides are, are men. And I really, you know, the work that I do at my my health retreat, uh, which I've set up with my partner Shannon, is you know helping men heal, connect to the heart, connect to the wisdom, their intuition, and to try change this uh, culture of neglect and, and damage uh, that has been going on for, for, for too long. Thank you, Rory. That was uh, really valuable, particularly reinforcing the message about how important it is going through the spiritual journey. I think that is now going to be reinforced in a profound way by Pat, who is sat next to me. I wanted to talk a little bit about plants, actually, rather than talk about me today. Um, I've heard a lot of the information that I've heard from you guys, I've been studying that myself for, for years, like years, I mean, <laughs> uh, it, was the, it was the studies that have been done on that graph from the 60s that eventually brought my body, uh, my, you know, my mind brought my body to where, to where I needed to be. Psychopharmacology, uh, I used to describe myself as a, when I was a rock and roller drug addict, uh, I used to describe myself as a psychopharmacologist. I heard it in the first Batman film with Christian Bale and thought, I googled it and it was someone that studied the prolonged effects of drug use and I was like, that's me. <laughs> so, so drunk in the pub, that's what I used to pretend I was, a psychopharmacologist. Uh, which is something actually that I kind of feel like I have a little bit of weight in now. The studies that are being done by these clinicians, and I mean, I don't mean these clinicians, I mean by clinicians, um, I, I've watched a lot of the MDME therapy stuff, you know, and, and I find that quite distressing that I can watch other people going through, uh, that there's cameras in the room, you know, I find that quite distressing personally. And the, the molecules, the, the alkaloids that you're, that you're using in these studies, um, have often been synthesized to within an inch of their life. And what that means for me is that all of those healing alkaloids that have attached to those healing plants over thousands of years, um, I work with a lot of them myself. Um, I had a friend recently that had a, an experience with psilocybin natalensis. You know, that's a nine hour event. There's the alkaloids in that are completely different. It can take two or three hours to come on. It's a completely different thing. It takes a completely different energy of, of person working with it. You know, it's a, a really magical mushroom. But I'm, I'm an expert, I would say, on, on DMT. I don't have any schooling. Um, I was too damaged. To, to, to survive school, you know, I didn't go to school very much. Uh, I used to hide in McDonald Road Library selling, I had a pager, I used to sell hash. And I'd hide in there reading books, you know, when I was meant to be at school. The DM, DMT, uh, this molecule that people are using, um, is attached to plants all over the world, you know. The, Rory talked about the Shibibo tradition, ayahuasca, you know, the, the chacruna plant. The chacruna, chacruna plant needs to be experienced in its full spectrum. It needs to be experienced with those other alkaloids. It usually needs to be mixed with Vanistaris cafe. It needs to be mixed with, alco with, the, with the alkaloids in there, the, the, the harmalines and the harmalas. Those are what prolong the effect. You know, that's why ayahuasca works a lot longer, you know, because of the collection of alkaloids. That are in it. I, I read a, I know somebody shared an article of an ayahuasca pill that some arsehole in a pharmacology place has come up with. Nausea-free, nausea-free ayahuasca pill. 
completely not understanding that the nausea is part of the experience and that we're removing trauma from the gut. It's a gut brain medicine. You fucking crazy people, what are you doing? Get away from these plants. These are plants. Uh, and they all have individual spirit. Uh, they all have an individual message. And often, um, often the, 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 the message on one of them is not the message you need to hear. You know, they're, they're, they're different keys for different psyches, for different traumas. They open up people in different ways with different vibration, different song, different energy from the, from the person that's holding the space, you know, and, 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 and there's not a clinician that has any idea about the spirit of the plants that they're administering. They just don't have it. Um, they don't understand the, the, <laughs> the, the, the integrity that these, these, these people have in these traditions that are, that are still alive, you know, they have a, the, the connection of the spirit of these plants has connected with the spirit of the shaman. They have a deep connection through spirit. They talk in a different language, the language of sound and vibration. It's an interactive experience, you know, it's an interactive experience. And that is going to be completely missed if we keep going down this route and, and we don't start singing and chanting and getting together and doing all those things that our egos don't want us to do, this work has to be done in group. It has to, we're only getting people, um, when we're working individually with a client or individually with someone, we're getting them ready for group. Uh, and, and there's no clinical study that's gonna allow groups because they're too variable. Just like the reason that they don't use full mushrooms or full spectrum DMT because there's too much variation in it. So you're just not getting this with, with this way. And I understand that it's, it's the way that we're going to have to go. But we have to now, at grassroots level, understand that unless we get the voice of the drum into the session, then then this will just be lost like gabapentin coming from fly agaric mushrooms, like fentanyl coming from opium, like, like, you know, quite crappy cannabinoids coming from a really magical plant. You know, this is, this is what we need. we need. We need the sound of the drum beating, bang, loud, loud, start doing it now. You know, like, yeah. Um. All of this information that you're presenting on these graphs has been done for 50 years. It's just new stuff. We don't need any more of this. We don't need any more of this. We need more drums. We need more drums. That's actually how we heal. We heal together in group with these medicines, full spectrum, full spectrum human. You know, um, I'll just leave it there. I only had a few minutes. Thanks. Pat, that was uh, emotional and a very strong voice. Um, I think you're obviously speaking on behalf of plenty of people in the room there. So I'd like to invite Karen up. Karen is another person with a lived experience of the healing effects of psychedelics. So Karen is the mother of two sons and has had a very difficult journey um, looking after her two sons who have had mental health issues on the back of drug use, but also uh, as recipients of treatment. Well, I suppose you call it treatment or confrontation with the police, hospitals and all the rest of it. So I'm going to hand over to Karen who has a, a very different perspective from both Rory and Pat. Hi. Can I just tell you, Jake just brought a, a shamanic drum recently. <laughs> Hook you up. You're welcome. Hello, everybody. We have been dealing with these um, mental health addiction issues for over 10 years now, guys. I consider myself at this point a lived experience expert and I'm here with my comrade in arms, Sandra Holmes. And uh, she founded Families Campaign for Change. And we are a grassroots campaigning organisation consisting wholly of mothers who live all over Scotland and we are a gathering and we are learning, we are connecting with lots of different people and when I got the opportunity to go to a retreat back in November I jumped at it because I realised that I had so much unprocessed trauma 
and I was not about to entrust the treatment of that trauma to the NHS. I'm going to talk a bit more about the experience that I had on the retreat. It was um, so empowering, so joyful. When I look at that window and I see all the trees, my first trip was all about trees. It was all about reconnecting with myself. It was about reconnecting with my family. It was about reconnecting with the earth. And I just sat in commune with a tree for six hours and it was beautiful. I cried. I saw the most amazing colours, fractals, you name it. And I felt peace in a way that I never had before, ever. So over the course of that weekend, um, I did two trips and, you know, we spent a lot of time kind of preparing for things and talking about stuff and, and integrating. And then the second trip, I lost my closest friend and anchor uh, in 2018. Now, she was a senior nurse in the NHS, because this is the thing I want to really connect with, the fact that I know there's a lot of good people that work in the medical um, profession, and I, I know they're being failed as much as the rest of us. Because she had, she was 49, she had um, an alcohol addiction, which was brought on by her trauma caused by the job that she did, which she was never given any help to process. Two days after she died, I got this tattoo as a heart because uh, as soon as she died, hearts just kept appearing everywhere in my life. Everywhere in my life. So my second trip was about her. And she was everywhere in that room that day. There was a, a wall hanging that basically was these stars pinging out at me. Um, and it was basically just her saying, I'm right beside you. I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. And she loved rainbows. And right at the end of my trip, somewhere over the rainbow came on. I came away for that weekend and I felt so many benefits from it. my relationship with my youngest son was healed completely from all the trauma that we'd been through over the last few years and my way of seeing the world and dealing with the world, it's just night and day. And I'm so grateful to the community, I'm so grateful to the plants, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be able to pass it on to other people as well. Because people, Sandra, in our community need this. They need this. So that's... Thank you, Karen. Oh, I think we're having a mother-son hug here, which is lovely. That was a lovely account. Thank you, Karen. Do you reckon it would be possible to like research, put research actually into the modalities? Because like you were saying, with all the sort of indigenous stuff, we've sort of lost our indigenous practice of using these chemicals. We don't have a sort of, I don't know, sacred landscape to take them here. Like they were clearly, you know, there's cave paintings all over everywhere and stuff carved and stuff that we imagine had something to do with them, but we don't really have a kind of spiritual like guidebook that's like sort of in our language. So yeah, you can go over to the jungle and stuff and it's class, but it's not a forest up near Inverness or something like that where it's like our land. Do you think it would benefit from maybe, I don't know, doing research into how the different modalities or different ways of taking it or different ceremony you had around the chemical? would affect the outcome. I think it's really important that you raise the points you raised. I'm going to get to your question, but I think that this, I think the divide between pharma and non-pharma, I don't really think it exists in this room that much because I think, I think there are two people trying just to speak different languages. And I think to be able to, to translate something that works in the community that relies on the scientific method, we need to be able to speak the language of the scientific method and try and translate how it is from the indigenous groups to the scientific method. Now, things will be lost, yes. Um, the milieu effect of the drugs will be lost, absolutely. The group effects will be lost, yes. But as you say, to zone in on what is helpful, it, the only way to know how to study it right now is to try and cor correct for as many variables as possible. 
this is just the way we know. I think there are people that are studying what is happening in the Amazon and what is happening in different retreats, but uh, their observational studies, yeah. by their nature, or by their nature as, a, as with regards to what we know now in terms of this method, they are not as rigorous as randomized controlled trials because they don't, um, they don't um, correct for a lot of different variables. I mean, I, yeah, I completely agree with you. And I agree with you, Pat, about the, the importance of using the whole plant and all the other components of the plant for cannabis, for psilocybin, you know, and for, for all these plant medicines. I think some, and, and actually I have concerns about the synthetic version as well. Drug science, we did a survey, YouGov survey about, you know, one of our worries is the stigma and the, the acceptability, uh, the general public, and of course, you know, the, the policy makers. And actually for that, we were pleasantly surprised that public opinion seems to be shifting. At least this was a, you know, about 2000 people do these surveys. and. Most people wanted, if they were going to do it themselves, they wanted to experience the full plant. You know, they didn't want a synthetic version. I think the other issue about group therapy, and, and Rory and I both work with Heroic Hearts UK, don't we? And those combat veterans, they will do a group therapy. And I, I that's what they want. And that uh, going, I think also going into the jungle is, is something that, that they appeals to them and and all the um the spiritual and the um the shamans and the music i think that's a really really important aspect of their healing i think the issue is you know how do we that costs a lot of money i mean heroic hearts are are <coughs> raising money for these combat veterans but this is something that there's such a great need and so many people need need this healing and will respond. So if we have to to make this more accessible, you know, it has to be here, and it has to be um, kind of it has to be practical. I think if we're bringing this into the NHS, it, it just won't be. It's just not cost effective to do it individually. We'll have to do this in group therapy. I think it, it should be, and I think peer led integration seems to work really well in the the imperial psilocybin trial so the patients kind of took this upon themselves and that's that's what i would want you know i want to be with people who've had a similar experience i don't see why we can't do all that in the nhs in the entire history of our species um, human beings have never ever ever suffered in silence they have never suffered like the way we're suffering just now you know often isolated in high-rise flats with no money, no jobs, no, no, no whatever. We're suffering in silence, uh, many of us. My mum was a sufferer in silence, you know. Um, and because of that fact, it's actually impossible for us to metabolise a lot of our trauma unless there is witness to it, unless there is witness to that healing. And that is why group work is so important and and just and just from a sort of healing the planet way um, you know regardless of how you make dmt or 4aco dmt or 4hoamet all of these things the, the chemicals that are used because i make them the chemicals that are used to make them are, are are horrendous for the environment they are horrendous for the environment um you know they're really harmful to humans i don't want to be putting medicinal plants anywhere near petrochemicals i just don't want to do that that does not work that does not work period for this planet um, and you were talking about the makers of the medicines these makers of the med i know loads of makers of medicines and they're not <laughs> they're not operating in labs you know there are they're people that are living in the jungle there are people that are living in mexico there's people nature's making wonderful medicine in this country you should check them out I mean, you know, they grow everywhere. It's one of the most common mushrooms on this planet, you know. And one of the most common substances in, in plant material on this planet is the DMT and psilocybin molecules. I mean, there are structural molecules in all life, you know, and we are synthesizing them to within an inch of nothing. We're nothing but nothingness left. Just this white spectrum on the, on the light, you know, and, and, and that's not where the healing is. Uh, the healing is in full spectrum community environments, you know, in, uh, uh, with full spectrum plants. 
Um, and I believe, yeah, there is, there, is, there is going to be a short period where that has to work in, in unison with, with, with Big Pharma because we are in a world controlled by Big Pharma and, and similar organizations. You know? So there will have to be a transitionary period. But moving forward, our voices need to be at the forefront of everything that we're doing. And I mean, when I say our voices, I mean the human voice, not the disconnected um, people who are running these companies that are trying to dictate how we're going to experience our God-given right to heal. You know, it's like, no. Um, so I, 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 fully, I fully agree with you, but it's, like, it's dying. It will die. Unless uh, we'll die or, or the, 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 the pharmaceutical approach will die. One of the two. Uh, we will we will end up back sitting around the fire, <laughs> and it's as simple as that. Just like in light of that concept of conversation, there sort of the SPRG are really keen to sort of ultimately. I mean, the whole point of us setting up is to try and bridge this divide between what's happening in the medical community and the realization that there is a lot of um, sort of wealth in regards to these um, medicines, and I use that term not lightly, because although it can have a lot of wealth for the individual, but there's also a lot of money um, involved in it. Understanding that, you know, when we sort of try and implement this stuff in Scotland, it's how do we, how do we sort of bridge that gap between what you're talking about, Pat, there, which is really the pure kind of um, indigenous use. But there are a lot of people who are unable to sort of get into that. I mean, that's what we want to do here, is we want, to, we want to start to widen this concept of evidence, because at the moment, in order to fit into the NHS, um, or even just to fit into the medical model, it's really, really constrained. It's just like this horrendous, linear, Cartesian way of imagining the body separate from the mind. Ultimately, we want to go pure indigenous, but the reality is that if we want to get neo-capitalistic governments to enact and, and take this on board, we do need to work within the framework. I want to know, Murad, how do people get onto the compass? It's still not clear to me. I don't understand, because it's like, okay, in England, people are getting psychedelic-assisted therapy, but I don't understand the mechanisms. And it'd be really interesting, just very briefly, I mean, even if it's just, oh, they sign up with their doctor, but, you know, it's, it's a bit mind-blowing that there are official routes. So, yeah, so they just sign up with their doctors. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, honestly, that's, that's pretty much it. So what happens is generally people, uh, for the first study, they needed to come through their GP. So they generally what happened is people would find it online and they would go to their GP and then their GP would get in touch with us. Or actually they would get in touch with us first. We say, actually, we need you to come through the GP. And then that's what they would do. The question I want to ask is, my dream is that I can eventually go out every autumn, commune with nature, harvest a natural product, bring it back and use it in ceremony in a meaningful way with people around me. I'd like to ask all of the board members, how do they think we can get to that point? If you want to do that in the daytime, you know, you have, we have to change the laws. I mean, the fact is these drugs, plants, you know, so in the States, the decriminalized nature movement has been very, very active. And they have changed the laws in so many of the cities where they've decriminalized plants, apart from mescaline, because the peyote cactus is protected. So they've kind of avoided, deliberately left that out. Why don't we do that here? We need at least to do, this, this is nature. And, you know, it was 70s, it was Nixon, it was political. None of the, we know, none of the drug laws are evidence-based, you know. Uh, a war against people who use drugs. So that's what we need to do. But we need a powerful lobby, and I think that is you. And they, they got together and they marched, and they, they campaigned. People like Anyone's Child, the Transform, very like your organization you were talking about, um, families who've lost family member to drugs, campaigning hard to change the laws. I think that's, that's what you do. It's you, it's all down to 
to the power of, of people and explaining. It's about explaining it to people. People don't really, some people don't really understand the importance of, of plants, of course, as it, obviously. So I just think it's everybody and you tell everybody and you nev we never give up. I've come to the conclusion that the war on drugs is over. And I don't, I don't mean that we've won all these battles that are still to come. I mean, the medicine is out there for the first time in 12,000 years, globally, all over the world. It's not going away this time. It's, go it's, it's happening in people's plastic tubs in their basements. People are growing. Pl it's happened. It's out there. It's going to be really, really difficult for the next three or four generations as we sort out the logistics of all of this and, and making sure nobody's hurt uh, along the way. There's going to be, you know, but the war on drugs is one. It's already won. The medicine's there. You just have to start using it and integrating it properly. You know, finding people with integrity and working with the medicine, it's already there. The, the law will change when we change. And we change when we work with the medicine. There's a reason it's been kept from us. Start working with the medicine. If we could all close our eyes, please. And take a deep breath into the belly. And I'd like you to sit for a minute and let everything that you've experienced in the last hour and a half percolate. Feelings of gratitude to the braveness of those that shared their stories Feelings of gratitude for the plant. Connected to the spiritual antenna of the dearly missed Terence McKenna. Flaw of attraction. Four fractions of fractals fracturing into fragmented factions in their interactions with you and me. In this perfect symmetry of sacred geometry, there is no poetry that can reconcile me with my enemy because my enemy is me, I see. And how could I look at me kindly when I've been stumbling through this life so blindly, monochrome, torn, all alone, eyes wildly searching for something outside of me, trying to recover some broken shard of me when the answer was always at the start of me, always at the heart of me. There's no part of me that could break away and not find its way back again like a jigsaw piece lost for the longest time. And then I greeted again like a long lost friend that I promised I'd bind to myself until the very end. See you again around that bend. Now and then I comprehend that time will bend and I will break and minds will rend and first be slate that I am I. And I am Jake forsaken. On the lake of time awakened. From they open up my eyes I'm shaken. From they cut ties with lies. Heartbreaking. I've spoken, my words are out in the open, play out my heart like Chopin, show me the world like only you can, I'm hoping, spin out a tale like token, mend the heart that's broken, I've spoken. <laughs>